Oh, I do quite like that. Oh, I'm, I'm running around the garden looking for you. Are we? Oh. <laughs> Here we are, yet again. This video is about Love Island. Whether you love it or you hate it, this video is about it. Love Island feels like a ritual. Even for those of us who aren't really fans, every summer it's everywhere. It fuels Twitter for the entire summer. Don't tell me it's called X, I'm not calling it X. It simultaneously fills that spot of FOMO in us and creates it. The theme tune alone is kind of annoyingly infectious. When I hear that theme tune, I'm like, I, I need a water bottle with my name on it. I need a G-string bikini. One of those things is a lie. I knew a girl once who, who said the only type of underwear she can wear is G-strings because if she didn't, she felt like she was perpetually gonna shit herself. <laughs> Love Island has given us some pop culture moments that have personally altered my brain chemistry. Do you want me to rap anyone? Live for me a bit? No, we don't. Some phrases that will never sound the same again. You're definitely my type on paper, <laughs> don't worry. So what's your type on paper then? Actually, on paper. On paper. And on paper. And questions. Lots and lots of questions. My last video on this channel was kind of like a deep dive into the Jeremy Kyle show. And I love you found me from that video. So, hello. Why don't you go ahead? Give this video a little like. Subscribe, comment for the algorithm, do all the things, and let's just get straight into it. If someone likes you, they want to have a cuddle in bed with you in the morning. I know, and I also want to be the person that gets up and makes everyone a coffee so everyone's ready for the morning. You may already be aware that the Love Island origin story began in the UK with the network ITV. It started in 2005 as Celebrity Love Island with the same sort of concept as we know today, but it was cancelled after two seasons. ITV revamped it in 2015 as a reality show for regular people, and it ignited this wave of reality shows based around dating and relationships. Back in 2005, when ITV was airing Celebrity Love Island, it also started airing The Jeremy Kyle Show, which lasted for four 14 years before being cancelled. These two shows often get compared to one another and that's usually for one specific reason. Within a time span of less than two years, Love Island and The Jeremy Kyle Show were linked to five suicides collectively. In 2018, there was a Love Island contestant named Sophie Graydon and another contestant in 2019 named Mike Thalassitis. Then in that same year, Jeremy Kyle guest Steve Diamond passed. The show was subsequently cancelled and a producer named Natasha Redican also passed. And then in early 2020, there was Love Island presenter Caroline Flack. All five of these deaths were ruled as suicides and all five of them were connected to these two shows that were on ITV. There's been a lot of scrutiny around the Jeremy Kyle show's ethics and procedures. In my last video, I was basically making the case that the show was bad. TLDR, bad. And a lot of people in that comment section, as well as just a lot of people elsewhere online, I've heard this take a lot, were arguing that if the Jeremy Kyle show was cancelled, Love Island should be cancelled as well. Some people even argue that the Jeremy Kyle show shouldn't have been cancelled, but Love Island should be. And that's because Love Island has more deaths connected to it. Although that's not quite true, we'll get into it. Now, I think because I see some of these takes expressed with a bit of a bitter or petty undertone. It's giving, if I can't have my favourite show, you can't have yours. I never really gave it much thought. Like, I never really considered whether Love Island should be cancelled or not. But thinking about the circumstances, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask the question, should Love Island be on air? But before we get into that, just like we did with the Jeremy Kyle show, we have to really look at all of the problems with Love Island. And boy, we ain't sure of those. But before we do that, I want to talk about class fame and safeguarding. His arms come off! His arms come off! His arms come off! We all know that Love Island has a bit of a reputation for casting ditzy people, but it actually casts a lot of university educated contestants with higher paying jobs, like Wes who was a mechanical engineer, like Anna who was a pharmacist, Alex who's a doctor, Camilla who worked in explosive ordnance disposal, she got rid of bombs, and Yuande who started her bachelor's degree in biotechnology at 16 years old and has a master's in pharmaceutical quality assurance and regulation. Of course a lot of working class people have degrees nowadays as university is a lot more accessible, but a lot of these islanders who have degrees do 
come from middle class backgrounds with trajectories into high status, well paying careers. Even some of the islanders without degrees come from massive privilege, such as Charlie Brake, who is their heir to a multi billion pound fortune and hadn't worked before Love Island. I mention all of this because class is an integral part of the conversation around the Jeremy Kyle show. The guests on that show were taken from a completely different demographic than those on Love Island, and the show felt like a pointed attack on those people. It felt demeaning, felt degrading. They were the butt of the joke. However, on Love Island, it, it actually tends to be the posher contestants, the posher, whatever that means, that get laughed at or don't do as well on the show overall. For example, Ollie, heir to a nine million pound family home, left the villa after only a few days around the time of photos of him hunting appeared online. And when posher islanders don't do as well on the show, I think it just comes down to the show being a reflection of mainstream culture. Like, yes, there are certain things that feel unattainable, like the islanders dressed in full glam every day, but they're dressed in a full clothing brands that we know, like Pretty Little Thing and Boohoo. Yes, they're living in a gorgeous villa, but it is only in Spain. Yes, they get to go on these magical, dreamy looking dates, but they also have their fair share of dating mishaps. Got to tits or whatever. Oh, wow. I licked her tit or whatever. Love Island has successfully found a balance between being relatable and being aspirational. So when there are very wealthy contestants, it kind of throws the balance off. It's no longer reflective of average members of the British public who are watching. People like Love Island because it feels somewhat achievable to us. It's kind of within the realm of possibility and hunting game with an inheritance of millions is not within the realm of possibility for most of us. Love Island feels like a somewhat a genderless reflection of the mainstream culture of young people, whereas the Jeremy Kyle show feels like a pointed attack on the working class, a show with an agenda. Another thing that highlights this for me is that Love Island is missing an outspoken authority on the show. That is what Jeremy is to his talk show. Although there may be a social hierarchy that emerges within the islanders themselves, there isn't a point of power on screen that the audience regards as having the final say. The presenters on Love Island are mostly impartial facilitators of the show, but Jeremy told the guests and the audience his opinions. With Love Island, the audience is kind of left to make their own opinions. Even if an islander receives a bad edit, they're not getting berated and shouted at on screen by a powerful TV personality. There's not a household name calling them a terrible parent, a low life, saying they should have been sterilised. Jeremy actually said that to someone once. This is an example of how the shows differ in terms of power dynamic and, in my opinion, something that enabled the Jeremy Kyle show to humiliate a certain class of people. So if we're going for a real one-dimensional, this show is good, this show is bad kind of view of things, you could argue that Love Island is better, but it doesn't fare so well in the fame department. So yeah. I'm from Liverpool, so I live in a country. Not Liverpool's a city. A city. Yeah. Jeremy Kyle guests don't get fame. They get their five minutes, sure, but it's not real fame. I talked in my last video about how airing out your personal problems on national TV could have been really detrimental to these guests, especially within their local communities, not to mention the general side effects of being publicly humiliated. But even though the Jeremy Kyle guests are on national TV, they're usually only on one episode and they're not public figures, right? They're not getting Opoly sponsorships on Instagram. Compared to Love Island contestants, they're fairly anonymous. And for this reason, I actually think we're less likely to hear about suicides connected to the Jeremy Kyle show. So it's possible that there's more that happened that we don't know about. Although not every islander will shoot to fame like Molly May, for example, they are still way more in the public eye than the Jeremy Kyle guests. Depending on their Love Island storyline, they may feel that feeling of public humiliation like the Jeremy Kyle guests. But the Love Islanders also experience real fame, even if it's not long lasting. They experience the paparazzi, the interviews, the hate comments on everything from their appearance to the way they talk, the death threats, the pressure to remain young and relevant and not become a has-been. With fame often comes money, even if it's fleeting. And some of the islanders just haven't been prepared for that level of financial management, which obviously has negative side effects too. And the show has been criticized for not adequately preparing its islanders for stuff like this. And this brings me on to safeguarding. Be interested to see if you're on my mouth or not. Why did you say that? No, because it was they were saying you're gonna get it. Did you actually just say that? Yeah. 
Wow. So under safeguarding, I'm putting all the questions I have about the screening process, informed consent, the awareness of mental health and neurodivergence, and the aftercare process. A lot of the issues I raised in my last video come up again here naturally. The participants on both shows are evaluated to see if they're mentally well enough to continue on. With the Jeremy Kyle show, that was all handled by producers, which aren't mental health professionals, but with Love Island's improvement to its duties of care, these evaluations are carried out by a mental health professional. Love Island has made these improvements somewhat recently, and the details are out online for you to see, but I can't quite work out which bits are new additions, so I don't know if the screening process with the older series of Love Island was carried out by producers, I don't know. And by the looks of the updated training that the islanders get before they go into the villa, informed consent seems like much more of a priority with the Jeremy Carl show it really wasn't. The difference between consent and informed consent is like if I had a box of cupcakes I could say would you like to eat one of these cupcakes and you would say yes which would be you consenting but then you bite into the cupcake and there's something in there like I don't like a Brussels sprout <laughs> and I was like oh yeah well some of these cupcakes actually come with Brussels sprouts baked into them and some of them don't. That would be me not getting your informed consent because I'm not informing you. I'm not laying out the possibilities of what could happen if you say yes to one of my cupcakes. One of my weird cupcakes. Unless of course you like Brussels sprouts in your cupcakes. In which case you're a freak. Love Islanders have had mixed experiences with the show's aftercare team. Some say it's great, some say it's not. Again, with the updated duty of care, we see that Love Island now offers the Islanders up to eight sessions of therapy post-show, and it seems like they are trying to do better, but I guess a lot of people would ask, why did it take multiple suicides? for Love Island to improve its duty of care policies. Some people will argue that the Jeremy Carl show got cancelled before it had chance to improve its duty of care policies, but I think there was a staggering amount of things wrong with the Jeremy Kyle show that it had no chance of being fixed. With Love Island, maybe there's still a chance. Out of these two shows, which one should be cancelled? The biggest argument that I hear around this is that Love Island should be cancelled because it had three deaths connected to it, whereas the Jeremy Carl show should have stayed on air because it only had one. This one death that people seem to recall is the suicide of Steve Diamond. This was the one that blew up in the media and caused that final decision for the show to be axed. I immediately have a bit of a problem with this argument because it implies that one suicide isn't bad enough, but it's also incorrect. There are three more suicides connected to the Jeremy Kyle show that everyone seems to forget about. There was Erica, Paul and Natasha, as well as Steve, and I talk more about those in my previous video. So if your only marker of whether a show should be cancelled or not is the amount of deaths connected to it, then yeah, the Jeremy Kyle show should have been cancelled. I also feel like this argument implies that the only things wrong with these shows were the suicide, but the Jeremy Kyle show suicide didn't happen in a vacuum. There were a whole host of other problems that contributed to the show ending. And it's the same thing with Love Island. The biggest and most obvious concern is the suicide connected to it and you might argue that some of the problems we're going on to discuss now may have contributed to the deaths of Sophie, Mike and Caroline. So let's talk about all of the potential problems with Love Island. This is me, do you know what I mean? I've got white yeah. jeans on, red trainers. Is that's that me. At the end of the day, you be miserable, that's not you. No, that's not me. Act like, like a waste man, that's, that's not, not me. me. Okay, let's talk about some of the ethical quandaries. Quandary is an underrated word. Bring back the casual use of quandary, I say. Some of these criticisms you'll have already heard about because they're quite commonly talked about and then some of them are less talked about. So the ethical problems up for debate, specifically with Love Island, are the lack of diversity in terms of things like race, body type, ability and sexuality, the promotion of fast fashion and hyper-consumerism, working conditions and workers' rights, the platforming of toxic behaviour within romantic relationships, safeguarding informed consent and monitoring of mental health during all stages of the production, and the pressure of overnight fame. So the lack of diversity within Love Island might be the most widely criticised element of the show, and there are valid reasons for that, right? Like when we look at season after season, we do start to see patterns. The islanders are mostly white or light-skinned, the girls are thin, the boys are ripped, most of the islanders are not disabled, and the cast for all intents and purposes are straight. 
Even if they're not actually straight, they're presented as straight because of how the show works. ITV commissioner Amanda Starvery received a bit of backlash when she said that including queer contestants on Love Island would be a logistical nightmare. You know, because the boys are meant to couple up with the girls. And, I mean, in a way, she's kind of right. The whole structure of the show would need reformulating, but there's probably something else as well, which is if Love Island was inclusive of queer contestants, the show probably wouldn't be as popular. Not only because of the obvious element of homophobia from the public, but also just a lack of interest. From straight people, that is. Queer people are watching shows like Love Island, but straight people aren't really watching shows like The By Life. Like, just think of The Ultimatum. It was called The Ultimatum Marry or Move On until the gay version came along, which was titled The Ultimatum Queer Love, and it was hosted on a completely different section of Netflix to the original series. It was separated, like it was a separate show entirely for a separate audience. I don't think it's wrong to have straight dating shows, I just think it's indicative of our mainstream culture what we want to see, what we feel comfortable seeing. That being said, I would watch the shit out of a bisexual Love Island. Are you joking? The chaos. With body type, commissioners can't really defend their decisions with logistical difficulty. Instead, they defend them with trying to make kids less fat? No, for real though. Commissioner Paul Mortimer said that Love Island is a sexy show for attractive people. He said, we make no excuses that people more beautiful than us are entitled to go into a villa for eight weeks and find love. Entitled is a strange word there. There's also another conversation going on about childhood obesity. If you want to look like the guys on Love Island, you have to work out. Oh yeah, yeah, you know Love Island, the, that show that's renowned for being anti-childhood obesity? The people on Love Island very much fall into that category of mainstream conventional attractiveness. They're very much the beauty standard of our culture, of our generation. And by casting these people and only these people, the show is sending a really clear message that this is beauty. Before we continue, here is a little bit of wider context on how young people are feeling about their bodies at the moment. The mental health survey of children and young people is something that the NHS runs, and they found out that currently, 17% of young men blame themselves a lot if they ate too much food, compared to a whopping 55% of young women. And recently, the study compared statistics over a span of six years, so from 2017 to 2023, to see how things have shifted. They found out that within 11 to 16 year olds, eating disorders had increased by five times. And within 17 to 19 year olds, they somehow increased over 11 times. If those numbers don't shock you into realizing our young people are experiencing mental health crisis, I don't know what will. Now, young people had body image issues before Love Island existed, right? It's not possible to just blame Love Island for those figures, but, the fact of the matter is we can see a correlation between the growth of reality TV and social media and young people's mental health plummeting. A survey of 18 to 34 year olds found that 35% of them explicitly said shows like Love Island contributed to their negative body image. Another survey on 18 to 34 year olds found that 40% of female Love Island viewers felt worse about their bodies after watching the show. It's actually the main reason that I don't religiously follow Love Island. Watching thin, attractive women in bikinis every night for weeks on end does um, nothing for my self-esteem, actually. <laughs> Having said that, I can't help but wonder, is it actually a TV show that is having this effect on us, that is making us feel bad about ourselves? Is it that? Or is it that your boyfriend follows all of the Love Island girls on Instagram? Is it that? Or is it overhearing kids at school calling an islander fat when that islander is smaller than you are? Is it the show itself or is it the cultural ideals that dictate how we interact with the show? And it's not just the audience that is affected by this, it's the islanders themselves. While male islanders do receive critical comments about their appearance, such as Curtis, who was shamed so much on Twitter he dropped a significant amount of weight and became an ambassador for Weight Watchers, we do see a pattern of female islanders being criticised harshly for their appearance more often. We actually see female 
Islanders the subject of hate more often in general, with the Life After Love Island documentary revealing 14% of tweets about male islanders were abusive in their content, compared to 26% of tweets about female islanders. A spokesperson from Love Island made a valid point about the Curtis situation. It is astonishing that there have been calls for body diversity, yet an islander who has allegedly put on weight is now being trolled because of it. And I really wanted to highlight that because it demonstrates the audience's own hypocrisy. And I wanted to mention something that I haven't seen anyone talk about elsewhere. They might have, I just haven't seen it, which is the youngest ever contestant on Love Island was 19 years old, right? So we kind of know that that's like the, the lower limit for the producers. So let's say that a 19 year old is cast on 2024's Love Island. That means that that islander would have been 10 years old when the show started back in 2015. 10 years old. I bring this up because I think there's this temptation to completely demonise people that go on Love Island as bad role models or accuse particularly the women of setting unrealistic beauty standards. But the young contestants grew up with Love Island. They grew up with their pressure and the standards and their ideals as well. You could not pay me enough to go through puberty while Love Island was popular. No thanks. So, Body diversity isn't really a thing on Love Island. And while there have been a few disabled islanders over the years, such as Hugo who had club foot and Tasha who was deaf, the representation is clearly sparse there too. And I, I don't say this to downplay or minimise the struggles of the disabilities that we have seen on Love Island. I think the disabled islanders do demonstrate how far out of the realms of conventional attractiveness Love Island is willing to go and it's really not that far. Race is always an interesting subject when it comes to Love Island. The show has seen more people of colour cast as the seasons have gone on, but even still there are ongoing criticisms about the lack of diversity in skin tone. We've actually seen patterns appear on the show, such as black contestants not getting as much screen time, particularly if they're in a happy couple and there's no like drama going on, and black contestants regularly being the last ones to be chosen, which is very notable in the UK version of the show. Obviously racial bias exist in other countries but it's really interesting to hear people of colour from the US for example talking about how prevalent they've noticed that this behaviour is on the UK version of the show. Yuande said, I personally struggled a lot because every man who came into the villa said their type was blonde hair and blue eyes. I just sat there like Obviously, I missed the memo. It was a struggle and I cried so much. Journalist Yomi Adagoki talks about the tension between wanting black representation on Love Island, but also understanding that means constant rejection for those contestants, which removes the enjoyment of the show. Fellow journalist Zing Chang agreed that she'd probably feel the same if Love Island bothered with East Asian representation at all. The experience that people of colour have on Love Island is often reflective of real life dating within the UK. For example, I've heard heard black women talk about how white men tend to look past them like they're not a viable option for dating and how there can be misogynoir within black communities themselves with black men being highly critical of black women's appearances and preferring lighter skin tones or the opposite happens where they'll be described by white people as exotic or attractive for their race you're proper weird if you say that to someone by the way <laughs> Often when talking about race in Love Island, a really good question gets asked, which is, are there people of colour on the crew? The producers, the editors, the casting directors, the production managers. Is there diversity behind the scenes of Love Island? Because that of course would make a difference to how things were approached on the show from beginning to end. Like I said, Love Island is normative in basically every way imaginable. So if you're going to question one of these things, you kind of have to question all of them. It might seem repetitive, it might seem like woke talking points that we hear about all the time, but you really can't criticise lack of body size diversity on Love Island without also criticising lack of racial diversity and so on and so on. Love Island is informing our idea of what's attractive and normal, but we are also informing the show's idea of what's attractive and normal. We are the consumers. They're supplying because we're demanding, or at least 
watching. You are a liar, actress. Don't show off. Why are you doing this? Here, I'm looking for something real. We talked about safeguarding a little bit earlier and about how ITV does have a duty of care to the islanders. That's not necessarily the complicated bit. Most people agree with this, as well as ITV. It's more like how much duty of care. In relation to Mike's death, Chief Executive Caroline McCall said that Love Island aftercare can't be forever. And although perhaps a bit insensitive to say so soon after his suicide, she kind of has a point. How would it be possible for ITV to extend therapy and other resources to every single islander indefinitely? But then we have to question, where does the aftercare end? ITV's aftercare in general, not just with Love Island, has been questioned, with celebrities like Kerry Katona claiming that ITV has a culture problem and left her suicide after an interview where she was slurring her words due to bipolar medication. Since the Love Island deaths, there have been changes to duty of care procedures, including all contestants are now offered eight sessions of therapy post-show. Aftercare tends to be thought of as the most important aspect of Love Island safeguarding to help contestants adjust to a life of fame. But I'd argue the bit before they get into the villa is the most crucial. This is where they should be getting told things like, you might have sex on the show, and we might show a censored clip of it on TV. Do you understand that? You might say something politically incorrect and be cancelled on Twitter. Do you understand that? Part of informed consent is that it shouldn't just be assumed that you understand something. Yes, the Islanders have seen the show before, but that doesn't mean they fully comprehend all the possible outcomes of participating in it. And of course, safeguarding while they're in the villa is paramount as well. Niall was an autistic contestant and claims Love Island did not make reasonable adjustments for him during his time there, such as him needing time alone to nap to manage his stress levels. And due to their lack of care, Niall suffered a stress-induced psychotic episode and had to leave the show. Although ITV paid for his treatment at a private mental health facility, their complete lack of understanding and reluctance to make adjustments is nothing short of shocking. Another new addition to ITV procedure is mandatory training for islanders before they enter the villa in race, sexuality, disability, inclusive language, allyship and money management, which seems like a lot of stuff, but I guess this is a way of ITV trying to protect the islanders from getting themselves into hot water by saying the wrong thing or blowing all their money post-show, which there have been accounts of. There's a dude called Dr. Paul Litchfield who was hired by ITV as their chief medical expert, meaning he has a role in the duty of care policies surrounding the Love Island contestants and their mental health. A few years ago, Paul was on a different job conducting a review on part of the country's benefit system where disabled people are mentally ill people who are trying to claim benefits are evaluated to see if they're fit to work or not. And there was documentation of a link between these assessments and multiple suicides of people receiving them. That documentation wasn't taken into account during Paul's review, but he says he didn't know it existed. Very shortly after his review, Paul was awarded a CBE for his services to wellbeing in the workplace. But the organisation Disabled People Against Cuts says it's hard not to believe that the CBE is an establishment payoff for toning down his review. And look, I don't know if there's something here or not, but I just thought I would mention it as this doctor is involved in the duty of care policies for Love Island. Love how Georgia goes on about how she's blank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am loyal. Banter zero. Strawberry cheesecake tastes like strawberry cheesecake. Like not strawberry, it tastes like strawberry cheesecake. I never thought I'd want to drink a fizzy strawberry cheesecake, yet somehow here I am. Working conditions and workers' rights within Love Island is definitely a criticism I've seen less of, but I actually think it's something really important and is only going to become more important the longer reality TV goes on. I suppose we should start with a suggestion that reality TV is work. I think there should be systems in place to treat people fairly, just like there are in other jobs. Talk shows like The Jeremy Carl Show are slightly different. You're sending explicit pictures of your private parts to her. I sent one and I was at a bad day at work. Because they're kind of like people are being interviewed and it's for a short period of time. Whereas with Love Island, the people are kind of like 
characters that we get to know and follow over an extended period of time. No, that isn't true. Like... Okay, yeah, that is true. Some people can be in the villa for two to three months, I think. And this is one of the key things that I think distinguishes Love Island as work. It's an ongoing process. It's not just a one-off appearance. Although something that we hear a lot is that it's easy work. And yeah, I don't think anyone's making the argument that a Love Islander's contribution to society is that of a bricklayer's or a doctor's or a plumber's or a teacher's. Reality TV work is undoubtedly less essential and maybe less meaningful but jobs don't have to be essential or meaningful to still be jobs. I still see the islanders as performing labour and I think that's where the root disagreement comes from around this. What we see is conventionally attractive people lounging about in the sun, cracking on with each other, basically having a holiday and in a lot of ways that is what it is but it's also just the way the show is marketed. The appeal of the show only really works if it feels natural and authentic. If we felt like we were watching the Islanders at work, would we want to watch it? An example of something I see as the Islanders' labour is them being mic'd up and filmed for 12 to 16 hours a day. Even though they're quote unquote not really doing anything, it must be mentally draining to be switched on for that long. I barely want to be switched on for four hours, let alone 12. It may not be physically or intellectually demanding work, but it is emotionally and mentally demanding. Also, you may have heard that the Islanders don't know what time it is in the villa. They don't have clocks or anything and they have to rely on the producers. But why is that? Is it so they don't really know how much time they're getting to sleep in between what is essentially their shifts? But come to think of it, they're filmed when they're asleep as well, so is that counted as work too? Very confusing. I talked about this a little bit at the end of my Trisha Paytas defence video, how the value of a certain type of influencer and reality TV star gets dismissed because the way they get views is by being messy or having drama. But whether we like it or not, the value is in that. People are tuning into ITV to see the mess in the Love Island villa. The islanders are providing that and therefore providing value and profit. Also, I think of it like this, there are pros and cons to every job. So in the case of Love Island, the trade-off there is commodifying your vulnerability. Having your insecurities televised, your embarrassing moments, your relationship issues. The work is that. And the current setup of reality TV alienates the islanders from their own labour, so much so that some of them don't even believe what they're doing is labour. There's been speculation on how much the islanders get paid, but there is yet to be a confirmed number. In Life After Love Island, Coco reveals that the contestants got paid minimum wage, which is like, fine, okay, lots of jobs get paid minimum wage. But my question here is if they're filmed constantly, what is classed as their working hours? This kind of undefined setup feels like there could be room for underpaying an islander. There was also a figure of £250 per week floating about. In 2023, the national minimum wage for 21 to 22 year olds was £10.18. And if you do some quick maths, for them to be paid £250 per week, they'd have to be working just under 25 hours. And that seems like a low amount of hours. It gets even dicier when there are celebrity agents encouraging prospective islanders to view the show as a good holiday to enhance authenticity rather than viewing it as work, which I can imagine has an impact on what the islanders tolerate and what they think they can advocate for. Something else about reality TV is that the contestants are not employees of the production company. They are independent contractors, freelancers essentially, which means they may not be entitled to some of the benefits that regular employees are. A lot of entertainers are freelance, like actors and models for example, but the difference here is there are unions to protect people in those trades. Unions are currently not a thing for reality TV contestants like Love Islanders, and that is something that I think absolutely needs to change. Trade unions are organisations that workers can join and basically they can negotiate things with your employer. You can go to your union for advice on employment rights or specific problem that's happening at work. They're a really good way for the worker to feel more generally protected. Like if you have any workplace tea, you go to the union, you tell them the tea, they drink the tea, 
they give you all the information that you need. And unions are really important because they were the ones fighting for national minimum wage to end child labour to improve sickness policies. I didn't join a union until last year when I was 27 and I wish that I had joined one as soon as I started working. Spencer Pratt, who has appeared on multiple different reality shows, says that you don't need a union for going out and being reckless and drinking champagne and arguing with people about petty things. Lisa Vanderpump, who is also very experienced in reality TV, says she doesn't understand how you can have a union for people that are normally plucked out of obscurity. But there are reality TV contestants who are starting to realise how unprotected they are when they don't even have the option to join a union. Bethany Frankel from Real Housewives has been particularly vocal about this, enlisting help from high profile attorneys and a union for actors. Nick and Jeremy from Love is Blind have actually filed a lawsuit against Netflix and kinetic content for what they believe to be inhumane conditions. And they founded a charity called Unscripted Cast Advocacy Network, which aims to provide reality TV participants with mental health and legal advice. So it seems like the US are on the road to organising, but the UK isn't really there yet. So my ex-boyfriend is Liz Capaldi. Really? No way! No way. No way. At Love Island's height, it can bring in millions of views per episode. So its advertising brands can gain a really big reach, just like the brand I saw at first, who had a 67% increase in sales during the 2019 series and a 254 increase on Instagram. If you've watched even just one episode of Love Island, you'll know that clothing is a massive part of it. And while Islanders are allowed to bring in their own clothes from home, the villa is catered for in terms of clothing. Fast fashion includes brands like Misguided, Shein, who remembers when it was called She Inside? Are you that old? Pretty Little Thing, Boohoo, Fashion Unique. The Fashion Checker campaign found that 93% of the fast fashion brands they surveyed aren't paying garment workers a living wage. Research also shows that fast fashion generates more CO2 than flying and shipping combined. And our culture around throwing away clothes and not wanting to be seen in the same outfit twice plays into this as well by making us buy more and creating more waste. In 2022, Love Island officially partnered with eBay to start promoting a more ethical approach to fashion. So a lot of the outfits that you see on Love Island are now pre-loved. Or are they? I guess the question that some people have is, yeah, sure, eBay is supplying the Love Island villa with clothing, but how much? How many pieces? Is Love Island still buying the majority of its clothes from fast fashion brands with just a few eBay pieces sprinkled in? And I suppose you could argue that if that was the case, it doesn't really matter because searches on eBay rose by 700% when the partnership was introduced. The partnership has been praised as a landmark for sustainable fashion, although there is something that might undermine that, which is Islanders continuing the trend of finishing the show and then signing a big deal with a fast fashion brand, like Boohoo, for example, who are particularly controversial as a lot of their textile factories are based in Leicester, which is notorious for exploiting its garment workers. And HMRC actually found that Boohoo was paying its workers as little as £3.50 in some places, which, if you didn't know, isn't minimum wage actually. And there's also a little bit of evidence that Boohoo tried to stop its workers from joining unions. So even though Love Island is partnered with eBay now, some people don't really think it holds much weight when the Islanders go on to work with these brands anyway. Although one Islander did go on to become eBay's first ever ambassador and that was Tasha. Tasha on her queen ship. I feel like you both fought Andre. I had to cheese toast the earlier. No. I said, you're feeling Andre. So I got to with cheese toast. <laughs> what are you talking about? We have made it to the final problem with Love Island, and that is toxic relationships. Our relationships and social connections are obviously a really integral part to our mental well being. And if there are problems in our closest relationships, chances are we're not happy. Chances are our mental health is not good. I think we really underestimate as a society how much of an impact the quality of our relationships have on us. And this probably has something to do with like how we view mental health or mental illness. Like I think a lot of people think of depression for example as an external thing that happens to you, which it may be for some people. But if you're taking antidepressants to lift your mood and your partner is being mean to you every day, you're probably still gonna be depressed. The quality of our relationships deeply impacts us. Plus, 
we might have an understanding of who we are as individuals, who we are when we're alone, but a lot of that understanding comes from interacting with other people, seeing how they treat us. This is where our sense of self-worth and self-esteem comes from. We like to think these are things that we can just conjure up if we say enough affirmations in the mirror in the morning, but they come from people treating us appropriately and respectfully consistently over time, because then we are seeing evidence that we're worth something. We're seeing our value reflected in the people around us. I've said a few times that I think Love Island feels like a reflection of mainstream culture, and I really feel like this for the topic of relationships, for younger people at least. The behaviour and language of Love Islanders feels familiar to us because we experience it in our own lives. We've all either been in or seen a friend go through a situationship or getting mugged off. And these are the sort of dynamics that get criticised for being unhealthy or as the internet likes to say, toxic. It's the sort of thing that makes older generations criticise the way that young people date, and even some young people themselves criticise it. People will often romanticise dating in the past, like it was easier or less toxic back then. Generational shifts mean that most of us are not settling down with our teenage sweetheart or getting married by 21. We're seeing more people, so our experiences are broader. This might add to the sense that toxic dynamics are becoming more common, but maybe they're not any more common than they used to be, we're just experiencing them with a wider range of people, so it kind of feels that way. Is the millennial and Gen Z culture of perpetual swiping, instant hookups, situationships and not putting all of your eggs in one basket any more unhealthy than our grandparents' culture of keeping a stiff upper lip and marrying 16 year old girls. Elvis Presley, I'm looking at you. But because we're seeing it and hearing about it more, does it actually mean it's happening more? Maybe toxic relationships of the past just looked slightly different and happened quietly behind closed doors? Like, for a lot of older people, any toxicity would have been likely contained to just one relationship, really, the person you marry and have kids with. Love Island is often criticised for toxic masculinity and misogyny, particularly in the 2022 series, which was ranked as the number one most complained about show that year, with fans accusing Luca and Dami of repeatedly picking on Tasha, for example. Just little comment after little comment, their general attitude towards her. Other islanders even confirmed that this was happening, likening it to a school classroom, so we know it wasn't just a bad edit. I often think of misogyny as slippery. Like, obviously the women in Love Island are not oppressed like girls in Afghanistan who aren't allowed to go to school. And because these overwhelming examples of sexism do exist, it makes it easier to dismiss milder versions of misogyny. But like most things, misogyny is a spectrum, and just because it's lower down on the spectrum doesn't mean it's not real. The less overt the sexism is, the more slippery and hard to hold onto it becomes. That's why it might be hard for people to explain exactly how Tasha was targeted by Luca and Dami, especially when you might need the wider context of that season to really understand it. This subtle type of misogyny always reminds me of my favourite Sylvia Plath quote, which is, I began to see why woman haters could make such fools of women. Woman haters were like gods, invulnerable and chock full of power. They descended and then they disappeared. You could never catch one. Women's Aid, a domestic abuse charity, have come out multiple times over the years and made statements on how the male contestants are treating the women on the show, such as when they suggested that Adam's behaviour towards Rosie in 2018 was disrespectful and indicative of gaslighting, or when they suggested Joe's behaviour towards Lucy in 2019 could be considered early signs of coercive control. And in 2022, Women's Aid asked Love Island to share more information on how they train their contestants beforehand, and the charity claimed there's specific information around abusive relationships missing, which might be surprising considering it's a show about relationships, and that it's vital for producers to begin to challenge unacceptable behaviour. I think it's fair to say that misogyny does show up on Love Island and shows like it, but that's not to say that men aren't subjected to unhealthy behaviour or outright abuse, because we've definitely seen that across the board, like in the ultimatum where Lisa literally hit Brian in the face. The way that was just brushed over. We see problematic behaviour from the women on Love Island too, such as when Maura kept trying to kiss Tommy and it was really uncomfortable. But the Love Island moment with the most Ofcom complaints ever took place in 2021 where Faye was shouting at Teddy. Because right now 
You look like a two-faced prick, and I, I want like nothing prick. to do with you. No. Yeah, you didn't exactly. fucking tell me the truth, did no, you? No, I didn't you lie didn't to you. You didn't fucking tell me the exactly. truth. Exactly. I didn't lie to you. Fuck off. This sparked almost 25 thousand Ofcom complaints and is actually the seventh most complained about TV moment in the UK ever. More complaints than disgraced conservative politician Matt Hancock's inclusion on I'm a Celeb and more complaints than this moment on GB News. Show me a single self-respecting man that would like to climb into bed with that woman ever. Who'd want to shag that? <laughs> the complaints had very valid points that Faye's behaviour was unacceptable, it was aggressive and it was humiliating and the fact that there were complaints shows that the public is starting to recognise that men can be on the receiving end of toxic behaviour too. As well as this, the fact that this is the most complained about Love Island moment and the seventh most complained about TV moment ever may suggest that the public finds anger from a woman far less acceptable than anger from a man. We've discussed men on Love Island showing toxic behaviour and they didn't get anywhere near this amount of complaints. But even so, Faye's behaviour wasn't right and a charity focused on domestic abuse against men called Mankind made a statement about this incident saying that they're pleased with the public's response on social media. They're making it very clear that the behaviour shown is not acceptable even when a man is on the receiving end. Toxic masculinity is a term that is fairly established online but moments like this on Love Island began opening up conversations about toxic femininity and what that means. What we see on Love Island is very rigid gender roles. Maybe toxic masculinity or toxic femininity things used to blame each gender aren't exactly the problem. Maybe it's the expectation that islanders stick to these really rigid boxes. Sociologist Alicia Denby says rather than describing behaviours as toxic masculinity or toxic femininity we should call it what it is which is emotional abuse. There's a trigger warning on this whole section. I don't really know if there's a way for you to watch this part of the video without becoming triggered if it is something you're sensitive to. The first person to take their own life after being on Love Island was Sophie Graydon, who was on the show in 2016. Two years later, Sophie was found dead at her Northumberland address on the 20th of June, 2018, at 32 years old. She did have drugs and alcohol in her system, but it was ruled a suicide. Sophie's boyfriend was the one who found her and somehow this situation becomes even more tragic because shortly afterwards he goes on to take his own life as well. This sent shockwaves through the Love Island fan base and the wider media. People just couldn't believe that a young beautiful woman like Sophie who was living this glamorous lifestyle would be so unhappy. The general feeling at the time was that Islanders were normal people, just civilians, who hadn't experienced Spain before and then were just thrust into the limelight. And often a blanket statement was made about Sophie, that she ended her life due to the pressure of fame. It's reported that Sophie was struggling with mental health issues for a while beforehand, as well as ADHD, but I guess with these things we never know the exact truth. Not long after this was Mike Thalassitis, who was on the show in 2017. He was 26 years old when he was found dead in a North London park on the 16th of March 20. 2019. Similar to Sophie, there was drugs and alcohol found in Mike's system as well, but again, it was ruled a suicide. The public had a similar reaction to Mike's death as they did Sophie's, but now people were starting to question what support ITV had in place for the Love Islanders once they left the villa. You know, like there's a pattern emerging. This question was probably intensified by the suicide of Steve Diamond that year from the Jeremy Carl show, also produced by ITV. A lot of eyes were on ITV at this point. There are also reports that Mike struggled with his mental health as well before going on the show, but there's no way to know what was happening in his mind. If you didn't know, in the UK, the biggest killer of men under 40 years old is suicide. More than obesity, more than cancer. That is outrageous. Our culture puts so much pressure on men to be manly and that translates as stoic, which makes them less likely to talk about their feelings, less likely to reach out for help when they need it. Both Mike and Sophie had cocaine and alcohol in their systems, which makes people 16 times more likely to experience violent thoughts and actions, which I had no idea about. A lot of people blame substances for their deaths and given the situation, I think it's reasonable to assume that it contributed. However, with the topic of suicide 
in general. I think we feel far more comfortable having a neat and tidy reason to explain why it happened, like a certain combination of substances, for example. It's a lot more uncomfortable to think about the nuance and complexities of mental illness. It's very confronting to consider that a celebrity or someone that we know could have been feeling suicidal for a very long time. It's challenging to think that this is something they might have thought about a lot while we had no idea. Fame or the press or substances are easy things to point to and say, yes, that's it, that's the reason. It's a way to externalize the problem. If you look at the press, they're blaming social media. If you look at social media, they're blaming the press. We say things like, Caroline wasn't wired for fame. Like fame is something that we don't all contribute towards. Like it was almost a genetic inevitability. I think to summarize their suicide, as a result of fame is reductive. It was probably a factor and no one is ever going to know the exact reasons. Who's putting pressure on the islanders? It's us. We are. Now, my understanding of the events leading up to Caroline Flack's suicide was significantly different before I did research for this video. And I imagine that it was pretty similar to most people's understanding of it, which was that Caroline abused her boyfriend and then ended her life before she could be prosecuted for it. I, I can understand that it might seem in like bad taste to talk about details of tragic circumstances like this, I am surprised that people don't seem to want fuller context for this Caroline Flack situation. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about the timeline surrounding Caroline Flack's suicide. But first I want to say, the more that I learnt about Caroline's mental health, the more I felt deeply emotional about her suicide. And I think that's honestly because I relate to her. I see parts of myself in parts of her and I know that I'm not the only one who relates to Caroline in this way. Caroline's family said that she was very up and down ever since she was a child. She always kind of had tumultuous relationships with boys and had a pattern of finding heartbreak extremely difficult. While Caroline was at drama school she went through a breakup with a long-term boyfriend which led to a suicide attempt and a stint in hospital. Her family explained that she ended up in A&E multiple times after this for similar things and Caroline had a history of self-harm including an instance of cutting so severe that she had to have plastic surgery on her arm. One of the first times that Caroline experienced a media frenzy was during her brief relationship with Prince Harry where paparazzi harassed her family and friends at their houses and she was deemed Prince Harry's bit of rough in the press. At the same time Caroline was becoming a more popular presenter, social media was becoming more popular as well. One of her breakout gigs was hosting The Extra Factor, which was a sideshow to The X Factor, and Caroline got into some hot water on this show for having a relationship with a contestant who was around 17 years old at the time, while she was around 32, and this was, of course, Harry Styles. Caroline got promoted to the main X Factor show in 2015 with Olly Murs, but the public didn't really warm to them as expected. Olly Murs himself, as well as the former presenter Demma O'Leary and Caroline's agents, all said that the hate Caroline was getting on Twitter was really bad at this time, far worse than what Olly was getting. The tabloids especially seemed a bit obsessed with talking about her love life. But that is why people felt she was a good fit for Love Island and she eventually got cast as a presenter. People who liked Caroline felt that she had a messy love life but was a romantic at heart and, and that's why people liked her. Let's talk about the year 2019. 2019 was the year that Belle Delphine sold her bathwater. Johnny Depp countered Amber Heard's claims of abuse with claims of his own. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle had their first child. And the Conservative Party won the British general election. It was also the same year that Mike Thalassitis and Steve Diamond died. On the 5th of December 2019, Caroline Flack posted a quote picture on Instagram saying, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. This is a phrase that has become highly associated with Caroline Flack and mainstream conversations around mental health. On the 11th of December at 5.25 a.m. the police got a call from Caroline's boyfriend, ex-tennis player and model Lewis Burton, claiming that Caroline was trying to kill him. Within 24 hours on the 12th of December, news broke in the press that Caroline had been arrested for assault by beating. The general story and belief around this time was that 
Caroline had attacked Lewis while he was sleeping, hitting him on the head with a lamp. On the 17th of December, Caroline stepped down from Love Island. So this all happened within the span of a few days. Caroline allegedly had a small drug overdose on the 22nd, appeared in court on the 23rd, pleading not guilty. And then on Christmas Eve, she posted on Instagram with this caption. Part of it reads, I'm not going to be silenced when I have a story to tell and a life to keep going with. In the new year, the winter edition of Love Island began with a replacement host. And this is also when a photo of Caroline's bedroom the night of the alleged assault was on the front page of The Sun. Despite Lewis making that phone call to the police, he defended Caroline saying that she didn't hurt him and that wasn't his blood in the photo. And this brings us to February, 2020 where prosecutors decided to press charges against Caroline for assault. The last post Caroline ever made on Instagram was a simple one, a day before Valentine's Day. Apparently on Valentine's Day itself, Caroline was treated by paramedics at her home, but refused to go to hospital. And then on the 15th of February, 2020, Caroline Flack was found dead at her home at 40 years old. I think a lot of people within that 16 to 35 age bracket that Love Island was targeted towards can remember just how palpable that feeling of shock was when you heard. Even if, like me, you weren't really a Love Island fan, you were still forced to socially engage with it to an extent because it was just everywhere. So the feeling of parasocial grief impacted people outside of Love Island's fan base. The story was that Caroline abused her boyfriend and then ended her own life before she could be prosecuted for it in March 2020. That photo that appeared in the sun was damning evidence in the court of public opinion. But in the documentary, it was revealed to us that that photo that was in the sun, the photo of those bloody sheets, the blood that we thought was from wounds that Caroline inflicted on Lewis, was actually from Caroline. She had self-harm that night like she had a pattern of doing. Although Lewis called the police that night, he repeatedly said afterwards that she didn't assault him. We won't ever fully know what went on that night or in their relationship in general. So is there a chance that domestic violence was present? Yes. Is there a chance that it wasn't present? Yes. What we do know is the blood in that photo was from Caroline and it was printed on the front page of The Sun on the 1st of January 2020. You might ask how the tabloids got that photo and that is a great question. We don't know this for sure but in court Caroline's mum explained that Lewis took that photo and then sent it to someone that night it happened and then within 24 hours it was front page of a tabloid newspaper. So if what Caroline's mum claims is true, it was either Lewis Burton or the person he sent it to that leaked the photo. But remember, we didn't know all of this at the time. A lot of people still don't know this now. When the news of Caroline's death broke, people still thought that she assaulted Lewis. And it was a weird time because even though this was the general belief people had, people were still grieving her all over social media with tweets and Instagram posts. And this is where the hashtag be kind came from. A lot of people felt that this outpouring of grief for Caroline was disingenuous, considering the amount of hate and criticism she was getting beforehand. I guess a lot of people were asking, why are we collectively grieving a domestic abuser? There was also a lot of discussion around gender with people claiming that if Caroline Flack was a man who had abused his female partner, people would be celebrating his death instead of mourning it. However, there were some people at the time that felt Caroline's story was a show trial, which is where the verdict, in this case guilty, was determined already. That the media took that initial narrative from the 11th and 12th of December and just ran with it convincing everyone that Caroline was guilty before she could fully explain herself. Just like Sophie and Mike, people speculated on the reasons for Caroline's suicide. And a lot of people believe that the intrusion from the press is what pushed her over the edge. In an analysis of the Caroline Flack coverage, it was found that The Sun published 99 articles about Caroline in the six months before she died. This was the most out of any paper. These articles must have been overseen by Dan Wooten, who at the time was an editor for The Sun. Dan Wooten is the guy who's recently been suspended from GB News for laughing at sexist comments on air. You saw that clip earlier. 
He claims to have been a close friend of Caroline's, saying that he only ever covered stories that Caroline wanted to be published. Although during the media frenzy around Caroline's case, a day before she took her own life, The Sun published an article about an illustration that was poking fun at her. Once the news broke about Caroline, The Sun swiftly deleted this article and some of their other ones about her, so they can be quite hard to find now online, and Dan Wilson did the same with some of his personal tweets. I'm assuming Dan had some control over these articles, as you know he was an editor at The Sun. The Sun was a big contributor to sensationalising Caroline's situation, but it wasn't their only paper, with the Daily Star branding her as Caroline Smack, and other papers making various other headlines. The coverage of Caroline brings up the question of bullying. Can adults be bullied for a start? And if they can, where do we draw the line between harsh criticism and bullying? Is it okay for the media to bully celebrities if it's believed they've done something wrong, such as assault their partner? Or should the press be censored? Should there be rules about what they can and can't publish? Although the British press is free press, there are actually two press regulators out there. Most papers are regulated by Ipso and some by the smaller Impress. Both regulators were born in the aftermath of the phone hacking scandal around 2011, where it came out that papers such as News of the World were hacking into phones of politicians and celebrities to dig for stories, which people thought was bad enough, but they also hacked into the phone of Millie Dowler, a girl who was murdered at 11 years old, which caused absolute outrage. The Leverson inquiry was open to look into the culture and ethics of the British press, and it was meant to have two parts. The first part of the inquiry made several recommendations, including to make a new regulator, which is Ipso, to replace the old one that wasn't up to scratch, and new legislation around the press. But the Conservative government decided to not to create new legislation and not to follow through with the second part of the Leverson inquiry, so that just never happened. Ipso is basically the press regulating itself, which some people think is good because they don't want the government dictating press regulation, but some people think it's bad because self-regulation may mean being slack and cutting corners. Ipso has been called a pointless regulator and an illusion of reform. The other smaller regulator, Impress, appears to be running a tighter ship as they've conducted more investigations compared to Ipso, despite having less complaints. So, although we have free press, a lot of the papers technically are regulated, but how much and by who and for what reasons are all good questions to ask. After Caroline's suicide, more than 870,000 people signed a petition for Caroline's Law, a law that would make it a criminal offence for the British media to knowingly and relentlessly bully a person up to the point that they take their own life. However, as we saw with the Leverson inquiry, the government can be reluctant to introduce new press legislation, and I can't find anything about Caroline's Law which makes me think nothing has come of it. Part of the campaign was encouraging people to complain to Ipso about the press intrusion Caroline faced before her death, but Ipso did not not investigate any of these complaints. There were also complaints to Ipso about the way Caroline's death was reported on, as some papers included details that mental health charity Samaritans recommends they leave out to avoid harming readers. But Ipso found no breach of ethics here either. And despite claims of a show trial, a re-investigation of Caroline's case found that everything was handled appropriately by the police and the courts. You could say Caroline's death has become weaponised within the media and social medias, something that people point to as a way to say, stop criticising me, don't you remember what happened to Caroline Flack? A popular example is the controversy with presenter Philip Schofield, who also works for ITV. Is ITV okay? That's what this video should be called. Philip Schofield had an affair with a young employee who he'd first met when he was a child and was accused of grooming. He experienced a media onslaught and in an interview that I'm sure was meant to come across as raw and heartfelt, Philip compared himself to Caroline Flack, leaving many of us feeling uneasy with a sense that Caroline's suicide was being weaponized. Pretty much everything that I've covered in this video hinges on this idea that Love Island illustrates what's going on in our mainstream culture. From the way the contestants look, to the relationship that the show has to fast fashion, to the way the media talks about the deaths connected to the show. There's a temptation to disconnect ourselves from this, but I do think that the UK's attitude to mental health is shown very clearly with Love Island. Be Kind was adopted as a hashtag after Caroline's suicide 
Its good intentions were clear, but it quickly became a phrase that people would use to hide behind on Twitter as a way to escape the slightest bit of criticism. Or it was used as a vague nod to mental health issues, a way to acknowledge the problem without getting too deep about it. You could say that be kind is a mindset, not something that is explicitly said, but an attitude that seeps through. Like, we care, but only a certain amount, only if we don't have to really do anything. To me, be kind is to mental health what live, laugh, love is to home decor. Like, I see what you're trying to do, it's just not really working. The be kind mindset is surface level, it's unsubstantial, it's lip service, it's virtue signaling, it's somewhat meaningless. We have more examples nowadays about how to open up a conversation around mental health, but we don't really know how to continue it. After we ask someone, how are you, really, and they answer honestly, we don't really know what else to say. We don't know how to substantiate the conversation. I think that is partly to do with our culture, but maybe it's also partly to do with the fact that we know mental health care in the UK isn't as good as it could be. Even for people who have enough money to bypass our struggling NHS and pay for private mental health care, there's still stigma there. Again, this idea of the be kind mindset often lacks enough depth to normalise things like therapy and medication. These things are often still looked at as things that should be reserved for extreme fringe cases only. And I think men in particular have internalised this idea that they need to be independent at all times. With Sophie, Mike and Caroline in particular, a lot of people believed that their decisions stemmed from abuse in the press and on social media. People believed the lack of ITV aftercare contributed. People believed that substance abuse or the general pressure of fame contributed. There is also research to suggest that some people are just naturally more susceptible to developing certain mental illnesses or addictions. And although we'll never know for sure, each case probably has a combination of some of these things. But the thing that is overarching and links all of these things together is us. It's how we treat each other. The way that we might leave a mean comment on an Instagram photo. The way that we picked on someone at school and never bothered apologising as an adult. The way that we make fun of men for crying or tell them to man up. The way that we tell our friends we're here for them but then don't really know how to react when they're opening up. The way we invalidate and dismiss each other's feelings. The way that mental health matters until it's someone we don't like. The way we vote. Voting in a government that funds an infrastructure for mental health care to viably exist would be a great way to substantiate your value of being kind. Earlier I mentioned the incredible increase in eating disorders within the last few years, but that's not the only really alarming mental health statistic. There is a general election this year in 2024, and in the description box down below, I'm going to leave a link to register to vote in case you haven't already. We've covered a lot in this video. This was actually meant to be a short video that I could get out quickly while my Jeremy Carl video was gaining traction, but oops. I think it's longer than my Jeremy Carl video. I really enjoy making these very long form video essays, but I'm wanting to maybe put out some shorter, easier content in between these longer videos. So let me know if you would like that, if you would watch it, what you want me to talk about. Leave a like and comment for the algorithm, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. This is the first time I've sat down to film in a year and a half. I feel like a, a whole new person. I feel like so much has happened in my life. Right, shut up, get on with it. This, a, pu oh my God. a publicity su stunt? What? I would like a moment for the plat, please. <sighs> Can you see that? It's so cold, I can see my breath in my room. And my landlord just put my rent up. Strawberry cheesecake break.